Brothers and sisters, welcome. It is another wonderful Lord's Day that he has given us, and we have the opportunity to honor the Lord and to seek to grow in his grace today. So I want to welcome you, all of you who are watching our online service this morning. This is the ministry and the video ministry at this time of Downsview Baptist Church. It is our pleasure to have our church family and even some of you perhaps who are not part of our church family and maybe you're expressing an interest in that or you're exposing yourself to the doctrines of Christianity where it's our real pleasure to have you amongst us together. It is our joy and it is our ambition that we would honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we will begin having God calling us to worship through his word and doing that in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. How great a text is this, isn't it? Chapter 8 of the book of Romans, 38 to the end of the chapter. Listen to the glorious hope that we have and the people that we are in the face of of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, what then? What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, he, do not, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, friends, listen now, all those difficulties, not despite those difficulties, in the midst of difficulties, the difficulty that you are dealing with this morning, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, things present or things to come, powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father, how kind of you to show yourself this magnificent God who would give love to the unlovable, who would give light to the unenlightened, who would pursue those who were running as far and as fast as we could the other way from you. Heavenly Father, how kind you are, how gracious and glorious a God we serve. We praise you this morning, dear God, for the fact that we are yours, for the fact that if we are not yours, you have given us an opportunity this day to surrender our hearts and lives to the kingship, to the lordship of Jesus Christ. May all those listening, dear God, receive from your hand what you have for them, what you have for us. We praise you as a church family here at Downsview Baptist Church that we are not gathered physically, though we're scattered amongst the GTA, we are not only looking forward to the time that we will gather together in person, we are looking past that time, dear God, to the time that we will be gathered together in eternity around the throne of grace. Joining our voices with those who have gone before us already to sing the glories of Calvary. So help us this morning, dear God. We are needy men and women and boys and girls. We will not see your goodness, but that you give us eyes to see. Your mercy is new every morning. Your faithfulness is glorious. Give us eyes that we would see morning by this morning new mercies. Help your worth, your precious value to grip my heart, to grip the heart of my friends to grip the heart of those outside the kingdom that are watching this, that they would be drawn in 
knowing that we are held secure in the hand of Christ. All whom the Father has given him will come to him and none will ever escape. None will ever want to escape. You will hold us. You change our hearts. You give us new affections for you. So we say, hallowed be thy name. And would your kingdom come. And would your work be done on earth as it's now being done in heaven. Thank you for the daily bread that you give us each day. Supply us with bread from your word, with manna, as it were, from your scriptures, that we would drink and eat deeply of your truth and be such, such transformed people at the end of this worship service that we would recognize that nothing can separate us from your love. And therefore, dear God, nothing can stop us from eternally worshiping your name. That is our goal today. We pray for it to happen through Christ. Amen. Stop.
Brothers and sisters, we are continuing here in our church service and our worship, as it were, online here with some news and events about our church family. We are very excited that there is good news that our church will soon to be reopened again. Some of that information that we've promised you is that we are seeking to come together, number one, on Easter weekend. And so today being the 21st of March, we will not meet next Sunday on Palm Sunday in person, but the following Sunday. So the first weekend of April, April 2nd will be Good Friday. And on Good Friday, what we'll do is we'll have a Zoom service together, which means at 11 o'clock on the 2nd of April, we'll come together by means of the Zoom technology. Now, what that will allow us to do is not get back to church too quickly, but it will allow us to have other people interact with the service. I'm glad to do this on my own, but I'm sure you'd be glad to see some other faces. And so that Zoom worship service will be a hybrid of the online videos that we've been doing, as well as the personal Zoom conversations we've been having after church and other times on Sunday. So that's the plan. We will give you the link beforehand. You can tune in and we can see each other's faces and we will hear from a number of us in our church family, reading, praying, preaching, and indeed we hope singing together to worship the Lord as we commemorate that day that he gave himself in the place of sinners like us. And then Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, two services. Just like we left off at the end of November of 2020, we will begin again on the 4th of April on Easter Sunday here at the church. Both of those services will be in-person services. We'll be back at the church again. All the safety protocols that we have in place, of course, but Easter Sunday morning. We will kick off again our live in-person worship here at the church. The 4th of April is the first Sunday of April, and what a glorious time it will be to come together as God's people. Two services, 9.30 and 11. Both services will be for one hour. We will ask you and to get back into the uh, groove of reserving your seat. Call the church. The, you can leave a message there. The easiest way is to go to downsbybaptistchurch.com on our website and you'll be able to register for one of those two services. Again, the same safety protocols will be in place. We will have the opportunity to do that, but we are going to sing now. We're gonna sing just at the end of our services with our masks on, obeying the bylaw, but we will add an element of live congregational worship singing on the day that we celebrate the Lord's resurrection. So that's what we're looking forward to. That's the biggest deal that we've had for all these weeks that we will be able to be back together on that weekend. We will also the following weekend then have our annual meeting. And we will do that on Sunday the 11th of April, immediately after the church service. So mark your calendars, if you would, Easter Sunday, and then the 11th of April, we'll have our annual meeting. We will have opportunity for you to be here, and we hope that you will come to the service and remain. It will be a, a short meeting again, just the bare, bare necessities that we need to have to conduct our business here. But also there will be the opportunity for some to tune in on Zoom to be able to interact those who aren't able to be at the church yet. But just keep that in mind, the annual meeting then. Again, when it comes to annual meetings, we do uh, present 
the finance committee's report from the year before of our revenue and our expenses, and we pass a new budget for the upcoming year. We praise God for the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ through you at this church family. We thank you that you've understood that to keep the lights on, we are the ones that fund this ministry. You're able to do that through the e-transfer system, which is one of the most uh, popular ways to do at the last while. Some people mail their men, their offerings in. Some people drop them off at the church or some people even go by and pick them up with each other. But I just thank you from on behalf of the entire church leadership. It was a time of rejoicing as the finance committee met together, as the deacons met together this past week. We looked at the numbers and there they were. Praise God for his provision and thank you for doing that. Well, with respect to COVID, as you know, we are moving and have been moving forward and have been moving through this. I want to encourage you, dear friends, when you think about this past year, this is now the second Sunday that we've been back after a full one year anniversary, which was last Sunday, how the Lord has cared for us in grace. You may know the story in 1 Samuel as the people of God came to the edge of the river and they set up this marker in Ebenezer, thus far the Lord has helped us. This far the Lord has brought us. And they were marking their progress. They were recognizing and celebrating, commemorating for even future generations that the Lord had brought us there. That's what that word Ebenezer in that beautiful song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Right? You remember this line? Here I raise my Ebenezer. That's a marker. Thou hast brought me to this place. That's what Ebenezer means. And I know thy hand will lead, lead me safely home by thy good grace. God has provided and provided and been with us through all of this past year. Be thankful. Don't give in to the frustration that others are doing. We must be hopeful and thankful people at Down Street Baptist Church that God has brought us through this difficult time. As you know, we are here in the gray zone still, at least at the time of this recording, and we will see how some of those restrictions are continuing to loosen up. Yes, the numbers have gone up the last little while, but so have the numbers of vaccinations. And a number of folks in our church family have been giving testimony that they've received that vaccination and that trajectory continues to go forward. Is it bumps along the way, but nevertheless, it is going like this. If it, if it has some dips along the way, it is still, trajectory is still going forward and upward, if you will. And by God's grace, we continue to pray that he'll continue to move us out of this. Uh, the vaccines are, are happening. Lots of clinics are now open in Toronto. And so we praise God that that's moving again in a very encouraging direction. And that's why Easter weekend, Good Friday on Zoom, Easter Sunday morning, right here, live worship service. Today, immediately after this, we're gonna have our Zoom virtual coffee just at noon. Look again on the bottom of this uh, video and you will see a link there for our Zoom. It's been really encouraging, really helpful, uh, really, frankly, just simply enjoyable to get together with folks for 40 minutes or so afterwards. Sometimes we pray together, sometimes we just chat. It's an, the idea that we're just having some conversations immediately after the worship service, which we're so looking forward to doing in person. But come join us immediately after the service at noon. Come on Wednesday nights. Most Wednesday nights now we're coming back to Facebook Live at 7 o'clock. Again, just go to the church's website where it says click there for live uh, Sunday services. It'll always give you a link either directly to the service or directly to the Facebook Live. You can always find that there as well. One of the things you may want to do tonight is take part in a hymn sing with our sister church over at Richview Baptist Church. Uh, you can just contact Grant and Bev and they will let you know how to get on that Zoom. It's tonight at six o'clock. Various kinds of, of hymns and spiritual songs and making melody and bringing glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. So keep that in mind if you would. And one of the things that we're doing today in terms of our congregational prayer, reminding ourselves of this unity in Christ and the body of Christ here at Downsview is giving thanks for, again, more people 
<coughs> excuse me, in our church family, that we can see them and we can pray for them by name. And today it's Grant and Bev Hallett. We realize there's more to the family than that, but we're just doing part of that today. We've tried to do that with the different aspects of our church family, not to just include everyone all together, but to, to focus on a few of the folks. Grant and Bev Hallett are our longest serving members here at the church, the most intensely serving members. I think most people would agree. If the church is open, they're coming through that door. And I had a dear friends in our church back in Thunder Bay. That's exactly what they said. If the church is open, we'll be there. And I just have appreciated that example in Grant and Bev since we got here. This is, of course, them out at our outdoor service last September when we met for worship outside. There's Grant, of course, helping at the actually it was a, the ladies' Valentine's breakfast a year, year and a bit ago now. And, of course, Bev at the... Uh, seniors meeting this beautiful uplifting time that they have they call it golden embers that they are still burning they've still got much to offer uh, Bev puts so much time into encouraging these veterans of Christian faith for so many years Grant Hallett I've said it before and I'm unashamed to say he's my hero here he's the man I am seeking to be like and we love each other in the Lord and we partner together in the Lord and we're very excited to be able to honor them today and ask you to pray for them as well we want to pray for Vit and Marla's family the boys you're going to see in a minute but of course here's Vit and Marla it's doing so very much quietly but with competency Vit, of course, led our church renovation project through his company and through his own personal efforts. Here's Diana with them making some of the changes, of course. This actually was also at one of the breakfasts that we have, both Vit and Marla behind the scenes there, serving and doing so with grace and with joy. There's Jacob and I showing off our China ties and uh, Noah and Nicholas, you can see them there even helping and serving and coming to decorate the church and being part of a Christmas play there. It's a family who loves to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful for their service, for their joyful service, for the way Marley is constantly eager to help when we come to church here, in particular on Sunday morning, we can't wait to be able to worship with them again. So for Bev and Grant Hallett, for, ne for Vit and for Marla, as well as for the boys Jacob and Noah and Nicholas, we give thanks. Let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you for the body of Christ at Downsview Baptist Church. I'm so thankful, dear God, that you moved our church family to give specific, personal, and timely thanks for people like this. For Vit and Marla, for their children, for Nicholas and Noah and Jacob. We praise you for them, dear God. We ask for your watch care over them as they continue in the renovation business. We've been thankful, dear God, that they have been able to have much success in that, even during this COVID time. We bless you for that. The boys have had to make some adjustments in their schooling. And so we thank you, dear God, that you care for them and continue to work in and through them. We pray, dear God, that you would indeed bring them to Christ and the saving knowledge of Christ and that they would surrender their lives for an eternity of joy and an earthly time of service. We, uh, we simply ask for that, dear God, this day. Thank you for the stalwarts that Bev and Grant Hallett are here to our church. When the church is open, they are here. And yet they do that with humility and with joy. They do that with grace and with dignity. They do that with enthusiasm and humility. And thank you for that, dear God. Thank you for their friendship for so many people. Thank you for their ongoing service. Even as we will sing in a few weeks, we'll have them back uh, helping to lead again. We praise you, Heavenly Father, for that musical worship that joins both of these families together in the choir and in the leading of our worship. We praise you, Heavenly Father, for their enjoyment of exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. We commend these families to you through Christ. Amen. Friends, we come now to the preaching of God's Word. And so let me encourage you, please, to take your copy of the Scriptures and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 14. 
book of Romans, the 14th chapter. As you're turning there, let me just a few words of introduction give you. If I may, you'll notice that we're here in the sanctuary itself. I have done the other announcements and such out in the foyer with the aid of our of our uh, PowerPoint and other visual aids there. I just felt for whatever reason that I wanted to preach right from this stage and we're having a little trouble with the projector behind me. It's not quite connecting as easily as we would have and so we don't have the PowerPoint slides to run through when I'm in here today. But I tell you, there's something about maybe coming back to just the scriptures and asking the Holy Spirit to cause us to engage with them and to drink in from them. I'm not beating up the PowerPoint slides. I'm not throwing them out. I just thought, you know, today I feel like let's just stand in the sanctuary looking for you, looking forward to you being here again and just going through the Word of God as it comes to us this way. So let's ask God's help, shall we, as we do that and as we work our way into the scriptures this morning. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable now in your sight, be pleasing to you, dear God. You are the one who is our rock and our redeemer. We ask for your help now in glorifying your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Transform us all the more into his image, we pray through Christ. Amen. Well, friends, Romans chapter 14, and we are going to pick up and continue in what we have been working our way through these last five or six weeks about the concept of the pursuit of the unity of the body of Christ. And David Hallett introduced us to this a number of weeks ago, and I've just been gripped with these texts. And this whole section from chapter 12 through chapter 15, we've moved around a little bit, and we're going to take a tour on a couple of other scriptures this morning. But we begin in Romans chapter 14 to see what the Lord Jesus reminds us about, not just of the pursuit of unity, but in the encouragement towards and the commitment of a maintaining of unity. Last week we looked at roadblocks that stand in the way of becoming united. And this week I want to consider aspects of things that cause already united churches to blow apart. And you will see that in particular in verse 20 as we get to it. So let me begin in Romans chapter 14, and I'll begin at verse 1 as our foundation scripture. The Lord Jesus, his inspired word says this, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the service of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand." Verse 5 says, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. Verse 7, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? 
For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, quote, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but decide whether or decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and have been persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing itself is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Verse 16 says, So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. But the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Verse 19, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. And here's our key verse, verse 20. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone who makes another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith, and what enters does not proceed from faith is sin. There is a difference, brothers and sisters, between pursuing unity that has not yet been arrived at and maintaining unity that has already been arrived at. Last week, as I said, we talked about roadblocks that get in the way of that pursuit of unity. Things that get as obstacles and we're trying to be united, but there's things we can't get over. On the other hand, there's also a unity that's been achieved, that's been experienced in church in particular, and there are not roadblocks towards it, but things that get inside that that explode it out and split apart and remove the beautiful unity that has been so long striven towards. And one of those things, of the many things, one of the things that can split apart existing unity is unresolved disputes, is unresolved differences between Christians. And I do want to suggest, dear friends, that there's something about that that has to matter to us. You see, we, we've talked about how it is that we should pursue unity. Let me suggest that a commitment to a pursuit of unity is a commitment to the maintaining of unity. And it does matter to us once we are united and where we are united, that we seek to strive to maintain it. The Apostle Paul tells us to the church of, of Ephesus, and yet there's something about the organic spiritual unity that we are united to Christ organically. We are therefore united with others who are united to Christ organically. That's true. We're not striving for that. We are striving for the experience of that. And you remember, for these last couple of weeks, we have been seeking to say, okay, how do we get there? This morning, my concern is, once we're there, how do we stay there? 
Because there's some parts of our church that we are still pursuing unity. And there are many parts of our church where we've already arrived. How do we keep that? How do we maintain that? And my suggestion is that unresolved disputes can get exactly in the way of the maintenance, maintenance, maintenance of that unity, maintaining it, continuing it, keeping it going. You know, in Romans chapter 14, where we've come today after having spent a good bit of time in Romans 15, part of the issue in Romans 14 is this difference of opinion over diet and days between people who are weak and people who are strong. Last time, and for a few weeks now, we've been saying that chapter 15 says the wrong application of strength is to seek to immediately correct the failings of the weak instead of verse, as verse, chapter 15, verse 1 says, that we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. And the first move is not to correct. The first move is to bear with it. And you think about, well, what are you bearing with? Well, you're bearing with the kind of differences, the dispute, if you will, that verse 14 speaks about, or chapter 14 speaks about. You've got some folks who believe you can eat anything or drink anything and worship whichever day of the week you want. And others are saying, no, no, there's dietary regulations and there's Sabbath regulations. And I think it's very clear from the text that those who are weak, that's what he says, are those who think there's limitations on diet and days. And there's simply not anymore. The Apostle Paul is saying, look, I'm convinced in the Lord that everything is clean, that nothing is unclean if it's received with thanksgiving, except for someone who thinks it is. Now, they're incorrect. They're wrong. It, it's not a passing grade. It's a failure of the weak, chapter 15 calls it. And yet... That obligation requires those who understand it a right to bear with those who need ultimately, at one point, correction. But here's the challenge. The challenge is that you can have an unresolved dispute. You can deal with these kind of differences wrongly in two different ways. The first way is all you do is talk about it. You talk about it every single time. Every time you see the person in church, they're trying to avoid you, or maybe they want to talk to you, so you're trying to avoid them, because you know it's going to be the same conversation. Every single time it will be that one issue. Every scarlet thread in the scripture leads there, and we're going to confront that person, or they're going to confront us, and we always, always talk about it. And we just, oh my goodness gracious, like... Let's bear with it for a season instead of always, always bringing it up. And yet, the other way to do it wrong is to never talk about it. Is to always avoid that person because you're not interested in having that conversation. We never provide an opportunity to say, let's reason together. All right, let's spend some time when it's appropriate, not now in the parking lot, but someday let's sit down together with our scriptures, maybe with some other helpful people, and let's work through this. It would be wrong to never confront the error, to never seek to resolve the dispute, to always talk about it or to never talk about it. And I'm concerned this morning, brothers and sisters, with never talking about it and that a dispute will go unresolved because we think we've dealt with it by not talking about it. And this can cause the kind of breakup of existing unity that we're concerned about this morning. Now, if you'll permit me something that I don't generally do, but that's to offer an illustration that's slightly more lengthy than usual. Tim Challies is one of the elders at Grace Fellowship Church here in Rexdale, or there in Rexdale, very close to us. Tim Challies also makes his living as a writer online, as a conference speaker, and writing books. Tim Challies, as you remember, lost his son just a few months ago, very sadly and 
obviously sadly, but very quickly and suddenly down in Louisville, Kentucky. And yet Tim Chalice continues to press on and to serve the broader church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am particularly grateful for Tim and his ministry. A number of weeks ago, he wrote an article that has gripped me ever since. And I want to offer this illustration to you by Tim Challies with respect to the error of not resolving disputes by never talking about them. We think we've resolved it. We're just not going to talk about that. We think we've resolved it. And yet how it can split the church apart and harm the existing unity. Let me offer this illustration to you. Challies writes, in the warmth of a Canadian summer, in the reaches of a distant forest, a maple seed falls from the sky. The seed is a masterpiece of design that looks and behaves much like the tiny blades of a tiny helicopter. As it falls through the air, it spins, and this spinning action generates lift, and this lift keeps it aloft long enough to fall far from the smothering shade of its parent tree. As this little seed helicopters down, a gentle breeze nudges it so it lands upon a nearby outcropping of a rock. For a day or two, it just lays there, exposed to sun and rain, and still a sudden gust of wind pushes it down into a tiny fissure. And there the seed germinates. There it finds just enough soil to put down its first tentative roots. And then it eventually becomes a sapling, and then it begins to grow into a tree. And as the years pass, this maple tree grows. Its roots drive deeper into that crack. They push with steady and unrelenting force. And finally, they break the mighty rock in two. Many churches have split. Many churches have broken apart by what began as something little bigger than a seed. The dispute was to the church as the seed was to the rock. Tiny, weak, insignificant. By, by comparison, it was so small, and yet it contained within it all the potential to eventually split the entire congregation in half. As time passed, as great relationships grew distant, as groups were formed, as battle lines were drawn, the dispute pressed harder and harder against the foundations of unity. And then came that final inconsiderate word, that final thoughtless action, the final misunderstood decision. And as a rock breaks apart from the force of roots, the church was split in two. From that moment, the little maple seed landed in that fissure and began to put down roots. It was only a matter of time before it broke the rock. It was inescapable. As long as the sapling remained healthy, as long as it was fed by sun and soil and water, as long as it was able to continue its growth, sooner or later, its roots would be big enough to generate the pressure that would drive the rock apart. The rock's only hope was for the tree to be torn out while it was still young, while its roots were still shallow and weak. But as long as the roots remained, the danger remained. And one day, inevitably, the rock gave way. And so, each Christian must be in constant watch against little seeds of dispute that fall into little fissures of disunity. Little disputes have their way of growing into big disputes. There have, they have ways of becoming far greater than we would ever have thought or that we would ever imagine. How good and how lovely it is when people dwell together in unity. How sad and how ghastly when we allow ourselves to be driven apart. Little foxes running amok can ruin an entire vineyard. Little weeds left unpulled can choke out a great harvest. Tiny seeds can sprout and split the greatest rock. Even little disputes, when allowed to grow, can drive brothers from brothers and sisters from sisters. Did you see the illustration? 
The concern is that in Romans chapter 14, we are offered a disputable matter that has the potential to split the entire church apart. And yet, if you notice there in chapter 14 and verse 20, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Destroying the work of God means to destroy the existing work of God. Not destroying the path towards unity, but destroying the presence of unity. Instead of doing that, we look at verse 19. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. You see a commitment to unity, to the pursuit of unity, is a commitment to the maintenance of unity. And the commitment to maintaining unity is a commitment to resolving disputes, to eagerly seeking to love those that we have great disagreements with, to come back into relationship, even when they start to be fractured, to come together in a way that is so Christ-like, that displays Christ's love and eagerness for the unity and the reconciliation, therefore, of his church, which is a requirement to maintain unity, that we at Downsview Baptist Church, dear friends, must see the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to offer the example from the parable of the prodigal son. Because it's important to me that as we talk about this today, we're not just talking about this in humanistic or worldly terms. That we just simply want people to get along already. And that we have uh, ways of, of dispute mechanisms that, that cause us to, to deal with troubles and to be steering them head on. And, and that's certainly what the world can do as well as the church. But here's where it comes to be a Christ-like pursuit. Here's how we move towards the gospel at the center of it. You see that, don't we, in that parable in Luke chapter 15 of the, the lost sheep and the lost coin, and thirdly, the lost son, or what we think of as the prodigal. Luke chapter 15 and verse 11, Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. As you know, he squanders his wealth and he ends up hiring himself out to be a pig farmer, a disgusting, low state for a Jewish person. And yet eventually it says in verse 17, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your servant. Treat me, one of your sons, treat me as one of your servants. And he arose and came to his father. Now. That's what the prodigal does, because he's committed to working this out. But that's not the picture of Jesus in this parable. Jesus, God, our, our Heavenly Father, they are pictured in the Father figure, aren't they? And notice what the Father is doing. While he was still a long way off, his Father saw him. How do you see someone who's still a long way off? You're watching and you're waiting. God is pictured here as the one who is eager to have this dispute resolved, right? When, when, when he is, is looking and longing for his son to come back, he's watching and waiting. The father in the parable is perhaps daring to expect hoping against hope, anticipating the possibility that if, if he could just come over that hill, eagerness, intentionality of God our Father. The Father says, or it goes on to say about the Father, while his Father was a long way off, his Father saw him and felt compassion. He wants him, felt compassion, and ran embraced him and kissed him. 
eager to reconcile. Do you see the picture in the example of Christ for us in this father figure? That, that this kind of commitment to reconciliation is exemplified for us in the Lord Jesus Christ, even in our own salvation. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son, he says. But the father said to his servants, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. Why? For this my son was dead and is alive again. He is lost and he is found. And they began to celebrate. God is not stingy with celebrating the reconciliation of a resolved dispute where it, where it had fractured this unity. He is eager to see to it that this unity is maintained, that it comes together as it were, that this, this opportunity to fracture it and split it apart for good is not God's willingness, but his eagerness and exemplifying for us an eagerness to see a dispute resolved between us. The key is to seek to maintain this call of unity and the maintenance of that unity. Well, how are, sol how are disputes to be resolved amongst Christians? What passage would you go to, to look for instruction, to see the bond of unity maintained, to not let it destroy the permanent work of God, where would you look in the scriptures? Where would we turn? Yeah, we'd go from the Gospel of Luke to the Gospel of Matthew, wouldn't we? We would move to Matthew, what chapter? That's right, chapter 18. Now, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, well, it's a familiar passage. And it's a familiar passage, 1815 is the text you're looking for, that has the same kind of danger as last week had. Do you remember we said last week that the obvious can be dangerous. And the obvious can be dangerous because we can confuse the affirmation of a goal with the achievement of the goal. Unity is obvious. Everyone agrees. Everybody wants to be united. Everybody agrees it's a legitimate pursuit. If it's so obvious, why is it not as prevalent? Why do we struggle with it at our church? Why do churches always seek, seem to be seeking to press on with greater and fuller unity? Because we might have confused its acknowledgement as a good thing with the achievement of that good thing. And so we had to be careful, we said, that we still pursue it even though it's obvious. Matthew 18 came to you as a pretty obvious text, didn't it? How are we going to be committed to resolving disputes so that those disputes do not destroy the work of God? Obvious can be dangerous because just as the pursuit of unity is something that we're still needing to press on for, we don't see it nearly as prevalently as we'd like. Who actually proceeds through the steps of Matthew chapter 18, because of a committed, resolute firmness to resolve unresolved disputes amongst the brethren. Who is the one who's been sinned against, who's eager to go and say to the person who is doing the sinning, can we talk? The Bible tells me I'm responsible to come and talk to you. Friends, the obviousness of it can be a danger to it. 
Because Matthew chapter 18 does not give four steps as some kind of arithmetic formula that we check off in the sparsest, most surfacey possible way. Did I have any kind of conversation with the person? Yes. Did I have any other people involved? Yes. Great. Now it's time to come to the church and we're going to say to the church, this person is a repentant and out they go. Now, I don't even see that happening much. But even that would be foolish. Because the point of Matthew chapter 18 is that we are called to have a heart condition that is committed to getting it right between the brethren. To getting this pursuit of unity once it's been achieved, to be maintained. And a commitment that we will get this worked out. That's what's required. That's the kind of heart condition that Jesus is calling us to have when it comes to this kind of an issue. And so let's examine it for just a few minutes. In particular, I want to look at the very first step as a aspect of how we will resolve unresolved disputes so that those unresolved disputes do not become little seedlings that destroy the work of God, as Romans 14 warns us. But instead, we pursue that which leads to peace and mutual building up. Do you see the applications? I know I'm moving from Romans to Luke to Matthew, and I don't do that often, and it's not advisable in the long term. But this is such an obvious passage it comes to, isn't it? And yet it can be dangerous because it's obvious. So I'm wanting to delve a little into aspects. Maybe it's not so obvious to you. Matthew chapter 15, excuse me, chapter 18, and verse 15, let me offer the text. If your brother sins against you, Go, tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained or you have won your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, it's interesting to me that this text begins with an incredibly difficult responsibility. And to a commitment to resolving a dispute that has the potential to split the church apart in the terms of the unity that's already there, a commitment that's required here is a commitment to do the hard, difficult thing, which means... It's going to require grace. That this is going to be a Holy Spirit empowered process, just as it is a Holy, Holy Spirit inspired verse. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. The issue is if you hurt me, I will come to you. To work it out. Hmm. Have you been in that position? Surely we have to some degree if we're married. We've had to come and talk to our spouse about how we've been hurt or harmed. Perhaps in an employer and employee situation, we've taken this principle out into the world, which is fine. Perhaps we've done that within the church. Maybe the pastor said something that's upset us. Maybe one of the leaders has done that. Maybe even perhaps a friend of ours. But I dare say, if you're anything like me and we're not that much different, this is an extraordinarily rare happening, isn't it? If your brother sins against you, tell everyone else that he's done it. Isn't that usually what happens? If your brother sins against you, the last person you'll speak to is your brother about it. If you've been sinned against, be sure that you are the one 
who can wallow in this pity and tell everyone and anyone except the person that the Lord Jesus has actually told us to speak about. We're weak and weary sinners. Excuse me, and we can get bowed down and broken down by these things. And this is so hard to do. And yet a commitment to maintaining unity will drive us to resolve this dispute. Notice that it's a dispute between Christians. If your brother sins, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now, here's my first point. Your commitment to work it out between the two of you, number one, doesn't mean you can't have someone help facilitate the process of the two of you working this out. And, and I, I just want to say that this is very obvious that you can have more than one person involved. What I mean by that is when it says, work it out between you and him alone, you're committed to just the two of us working this out. But this has been a grievous sin. This is something that has hurt you deeply. This is maybe a sin from a man to a woman. Maybe it's a very abusive situation. Maybe it's from a person with very little authority and prominence in a church to someone who's got more authority and, and more power, apparently, more seniority, looked on as significant by other people in the church. Maybe this is someone who's much older and far more mature, who has sinned against someone who's far younger and very new at this. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are situations that it not only is not only, it's not only wise, but it almost is un, unattainable without some outside help. And yet the person who's been sinned against says, no, no, I'm committed that I've got to work it out with just the two of us. The working out is between the two of us. But I may say, listen, Joe, can you come to me because Tim and I have got to work out this challenge. And I'm not asking you to help work it out. We're not asking for a mediator. We're not asking someone to work it out between the two of us because we just can't. No, no, we're going to do this. But you're going to help us set up an environment that shows that we're serious and we're determined, at least the person who's been sinned against, is determined to work this through. They're intentional. They're eager. They're looking for the opportunity to do this, just like the picture of Christ in the parable. They're wanting to be Christ-like. I'm wanting to pursue this with this other person. But I'm going to need some help setting this up. I'm going to need some interaction. We may need some safety because it may be a man and woman situation and it's not wise for them to meet alone on their own. It's not prudent, especially these days. It may be almost impossible because the other person is, is of such prominence and position that they're just unwilling to do it. And perhaps you need someone else to say, let's make this happen. What I'm just suggesting, friends, is number one, because you're called to do it between the two of you, doesn't mean that the body of Christ can help facilitate the process. Why do I mention that? I mention that because this is, in my few years of pastoral experience, one of the number one reasons that I have found that people don't do this. It's too frightening for me to go and speak to him. She just intimidates me too much. I tried to make the phone call and it's just too difficult. You know what? I even broached the issue a little bit and there was a total unwillingness to have this conversation. See what I'm saying? And so people say, look, Live at peace with all men. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. So I give it a go. And you know what? I, I just, I'm not trying hard. Or I so desperately want to do this, but I just cannot imagine 
how I could actually go to that person one-on-one. -on -one. Or it's a man and a woman, and it says, it's just not prudent for me to sit down with another man's wife by myself and say, here's how you've sinned against me. Here's how you've hurt me. Can we talk about this? There's wisdom in the help of the body of Christ that together has this commitment to maintain this unity, which means a commitment to resolve this dispute, not by never talking about it and not by always talking about it, but hitting it head on like the Lord Jesus is calling us to here and say, I'm going to come right at it. Number one, we can use outside help. And number two, we can persevere in this first step more than once. I've also heard people come to this and say, no, no, you go to your brother once and show him his sin. And if you haven't won him, then you move to step two. The text says nothing about once. The implication that I'm suggesting, brothers and sisters, is that there's not only another person involved, but there's a perseverance involved. We're going to go back to this again. Think about a really deeply divisive issue between two people that maybe even has been put off for a while. Or maybe the relationship is really strained, which is where sin often occurs. The first shot at this may just be a, a, a rehearsing of the bidding. We're just both making our positions clear. You did this to me and here's how I felt. No, that's not what I did and that's not what I meant. Okay, it seemed like that to you. Well, why do you say that? Why are you accusing me? Because I'm telling you how I felt. Well, it seems like you're judging me. Well, it seems like you're unwilling to be judged. And I think we have to have this conversation. You know what? This is just too much for me. And, and, and maybe the first conversation is five minutes. And there's someone else maybe who's helping to facilitate this. You say, okay, that was a start. In fact, it was a good, obedient start. In fact, it was a good, God-pleasing start because we've done what God's called us to do. Well, it didn't work. I guess we bring two or three people into it. Notice that even the second step, what are the two or three people for? And, and who's bringing them? If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. That means the person who's been sinned against takes two or three people with them and, 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 and she brings them along with her. What, what are these? Look, you didn't listen to me, so you're going to listen to my lawyers. You're going to listen to my advocates. You're going to listen to my husband or my big brother or the pastor or a church leader or some other neighbor or someone, right? We're going to, we're going to gang up on you. Is that what Jesus is saying? <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus is saying very clearly, bring one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. These other people are there to see that what's being said is clear and concise and comprehended by everyone involved so we can say, here's what actually happened. Because very often, we will actually be in a situation that it really is a lack of understanding. I know sometimes people say, oh, it's just a misunderstanding, flippantly. Sometimes it's actually that. Sometimes I can give offense and I, honest to goodness with God as my witness, did not know I did. And I should want to know, don't you? Don't, don't you want to know if you've offended someone, sinned against them? Don't you want to know if you have hurt them? Don't you want to know if there's a stress and a possible fracture in this relationship? Wouldn't you want it resolved? If we're like that father, he's looking. He's looking down the road. He's eagerly waiting and anticipating. Remember, he went along with this. Okay, I'll... I guess I'll give you your share of the estate. He's trying to figure this all out. He's trying to work with them, so to speak. But he's eager that this wouldn't be the end of it. And friends, we don't want a fractured relationship to be the end of our relationship. 
not for brothers and sisters in the Lord here at this church. Jesus doesn't permit that. And what I'm suggesting is, before we stampede to the second step of this, we persevere. We say, okay. Look, I know that was hard on both of us. That was really hard for me to come. I'm sure you understand that. But as a brother in the Lord, can we give this a shot again? I'll try to be less accusatory. You try to be less defensive. I'll try to stop calling you defensive and you'll try to stop calling me accusatory. We'll try to stop judging each other's motives. We'll try to recognize that this is a process that the Lord Jesus who loves us and cares for us and died on the cross so that we could be reconciled. This is what he wants for us. King Jesus has already ruled on this. We have no option to go forward in Christ but to seek to reconcile this relationship, to resolve this dispute, to not see the work of God destroyed, but to pursue peace and uplifting for one another. This is, this is how we do this. C can we meet again? And maybe this time we don't need the help of another person. Maybe it's a little safer. If it's an ongoing relationship between a, a man and a woman, I think it's always right that there's someone else there. But there's ways to do that in a, in a distance in the room or in the same building or however that might be accomplished. But there's something to persevering. I'm not trying to bring anybody else in this. As soon as you do that, it's complicated, right? It's escalated. The volume, the intensity, the defensiveness, the shame, the embarrassment, all those things are ratcheted up. If we have to go there, we'll go there. But I'm persevering. And the spirit of this not only allows for it, I think it suggests it. There's a persevering. I'm going to get back at this. I'm going to give it my heart effort. And I might come back a third time. And there might be a bit of time that passes. It's not always convenient. It's not the only thing the other person has to do. There's legitimate realities that the world keeps on turning. Well, it's been so long. Well, they may not necessarily duck in this. It, it may take some perseverance and some grit and some stick to it -ness. I want this relationship because I want this church family together on this. I do not want to see the work of God destroyed. So friends at Downsview, just consider this as part of the application of our broader context of the pursuit of unity. A commitment to the pursuit of it must entail a pursuit or at least a commitment to the maintaining of it once it's there. And unresolved disputes, not the only way, but it's one of the key ways that can split this unity apart. And so we want to resolve those disputes the way King Jesus calls us to do it. As weird and uncomfortable and odd and seemingly impossible as it might seem to us, this is the rule book. It's not just a guideline. This is how we do it. That, that if we love Jesus, we will keep his commands. And the commands that he gives us come with the grace to obey them. The Holy Spirit will give us what we require to obey our Lord. And what a joy. What an absolute thrill it is to see the unity of the people of God maintained because we did the hard thing. It's hard, but it's worth it. Because the glory of Christ and his gospel is on display in the pursuit of and in the maintaining of our unity here at Downsview Baptist Church. Let's pray. Father, I acknowledge that we have merely skated over the surface of some issues that are very deep and lots of what if, what abouts. And perhaps, dear God, as we move forward in our study, we will see your revelation of all the more depth of this. 
But I pray, dear God, that you will give us as your people the tools to deal head on with maintaining the unity that you have given, that we would not see the work of God destroyed over disputes, but Heavenly Father, that you would see those disputes dissolved, those disputes would be resolved and dissolve away to the end that the maintenance of our unity here at Downsview Baptist Church would display the maintaining of your love for us, a love that we have from you, that you promise you will never let us go. Hear our prayers, we offer it now through Christ. Amen.